On the 25th of March 1928, a young American composer arrived in Paris with grand ambitions. He wanted to capture the distinctive atmosphere of the city in a piece of music. The composer's name was George Gershwin, and his inspiration came from the streets themselves. Gershwin was overwhelmed by the noise, the pace, and the energy of this city. And he used that energy, including the energy of the traffic itself, to create one of the most exhilarating pieces of music of the century. And he called it an American in Paris. It is a glorious piece of music, and it captures the spirit of Paris perfectly. Elegant, exuberant, and romantic. Like so many others before him, George Gershwin thought Paris was the most exciting place on the planet. But you know what? I think it was never more exciting than in the year he actually wrote that piece, 1928. Nineteen twenty eight was the high point of an unusually creative decade. It was the year that the Surrealists brought their irrational world order to the people. When European emigres set the city alight with their ambitious dreams. When visiting Americans launched sparkling careers. And when utopian modernists redesigned the world. One city one exceptional year. But like all the best parties, it would come to a dramatic end. This is the story of Paris in 1928. The bash before the crash. In the early 1920s, Paris was still recovering from the First World War. There were food queues and damaged buildings, disillusionment and grief. But by the end of the decade, Paris had somehow rebuilt its reputation as the most glamorous city in the world, attracting the finest artists, writers and thinkers of the day. It was the great interwar utopia where everything was up for grabs and everyone was living in the moment. The centre of this party in 1928 was Montparnasse, a cheap, rundown neighbourhood on the left bank. And the centre of Montparnasse was a cafe called La Coupole, which had just opened its doors. In 1928, La Coupole was the largest restaurant in Paris, and its interior is an Art Deco masterpiece, with Jazz Age colours, cubist mosaics and 33 famous pillars, each of which was painted by an artist from Montparnasse. John, so what was so appealing about Paris in the 1920s? Oh, where to start? Uh, that people coming to Paris uh, in the 20s came here for three reasons. One, because they were rich. Women came here to buy their trousseau, to get a French maid, to get a French chef. The men came here to go to the brothels, to buy art, to hunt and so on. At the other end of the spectrum, you came here because you were poor, because food was cheap. If, if you had to starve in a garret while you learn to become a great musician or a great, uh, a great writer, you could starve longer in Paris than you could in any other civilised uh, city in the world. And then in the middle were people who came here because you could do stuff that you couldn't do elsewhere. What made Paris so attractive to artists? Everybody who came here believed that they were going to succeed because it was Paris. You could go and learn from Matisse. You could go and, 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 and visit Picasso and he would explain uh, what he'd been doing. I mean, that's, that's priceless. Where else does that happen? 
It was a magnet. It drew people from all around the world. And within this crucible, new movements were formed. After all, you cannot point to another city where so many artistic movements began and, 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 and rose to, to their peak. It was a great time to be an artist, really. I wish I'd been there, frankly. So what was Paris's next big art movement? Well, it would be stranger than anything before or since. It was called Surrealism, and its ringleader was a mischievous and highly original writer called André Breton. Breton had been a doctor during the First World War. Like many people, the conflict changed him and it led him to a revelation. Breton concluded that Europe was rotten to its core. Reason, logic, capitalism, the great motors of Western civilization had led the world into the most terrible disaster in its history. What was needed now was a fundamental change a revolution that would come from within every single one of us. Breton's antidote to the horrors of war was to celebrate the absurdity of the human experience. And so Breton and his friends opened a very unusual office. How are you recovering from the first world war? It's okay. Do you lust after? Do you ever what's the dinner you cry? Anything you've ever done. Tell me about your nightmares. All is confidential here. Tell me. I used to be a doctor. They called it the Bureau of Surrealist Research. And its purpose was to capture the disruptive energy of the unconscious. The Bureau of Surrealist Research asked the public to come into the office and confess. Now, as a member of the public, you could confess pretty much anything. If you'd had an awful secret you'd been keeping, if you lusted after a colleague or even a family member, if you'd committed a crime and not yet got caught, or even if you had some unsettling dream, dream or nightmare, this was the place to reveal everything. And that was all part of André Breton's plan to explode bourgeois conventions, to liberate people's unconsciouses, and to change their lives for good. The Bureau was open to the public every day, from 4.30 to 6.30 in the afternoon, except Sundays. There was just one problem. Not that many people took up the offer to confess their deepest secrets to a complete stranger. The office files remained largely empty. But Breton didn't give up. In the name of the Surrealist Revolution, he decided to write a surreal fantasy of his own. A book called Nadja, which he published in 1928. Nadja is a love story, without the love and without the story. It's the tale of an illicit affair set in a strange, haunting Paris. And it begins with something only a great city like Paris can provide, a chance encounter. It is a late autumn afternoon. Workers are going home for the evening. Breton is drifting aimlessly along the street when he catches sight of a beautiful and mysterious woman. Without hesitation, he approaches her. He asks her name. She tells him, Nadja. And it turns out she's everything he's been looking for. The next day, 
they meet in a secret square in Paris. And Nadja begins to tune into a city that Breton can't even see. She senses crowds where there are none. She sees bloody visions of the French Revolution in the empty streets, and even predicts that he'll write a novel about her. Breton is captivated, but it's not love that's hooked him. It seems in Nadja he's finally found the perfect symbol of surrealism, a beautiful enigma with no rational explanation, a pathway to the unconscious itself. Breton's haunting book poses more questions than answers. Who was Nadja? What happened to her? Did she even exist? But one thing is certain. Breton had turned Paris into a great surrealist dreamscape, a place that was as seductive and mysterious as Nadja herself. While André Breton conjured up surrealist fantasies in the cafes of Montparnasse, one man would close the gap between dreams and reality even more dramatically. And he would do it very discreetly in the suburbs. Seven miles east of downtown Paris was a sleepy neighborhood called Perreur sur Marne. It was an ordinary place full of teachers, dentists, and retired accountants going about their business. And in their midst was a young man who seemed to fit in just perfectly. This man lived quietly and carefully. He always wore a suit. He worked to a strict routine. He walked his dog at the same time every single day. And in the evening, his idea of fun was a game of chess. All in all, he seemed as unremarkable as all the other residents of Perreux sur Marne. But this man was actually an undercover surrealist, and his name was René Magritte. Magritte was born in Belgium in 1898. He had his first exhibition as an artist in Brussels in 1927, but it was so unsuccessful that he left for Paris to join the Surrealists. This one's the, uh, the button. Monsieur Morin? C'est James Fox, est-ce que je peux entrer? Magritte lived on the top floor of this building with his wife from 1927 to 1930. Now, Magritte didn't actually have a proper studio space here, so most of his painting was done in his sitting room. But if that doesn't sound perfect, it obviously suited him, because it was here that he started to paint his first surrealist painting, some of the most famous paintings of the 20th century. And what's more, 1928 was the most productive year of his entire career. That year he made more than a hundred pictures. That's what, more than one every three days. In his paintings, Magritte played with the bizarre and often amusing tension between dreams and reality. This painting is called The Treachery of Images. We see a pipe, and underneath it, a sentence that reads, this is not a pipe. <laughs> now, at first, it seems pretty nonsensical, but Magritte is, of course, completely right, because that isn't a pipe. You can't smoke it, you can't even hold it. What it actually is, is a picture, an arrangement of coloured paint on a canvas. And it's a reminder, a really important reminder, that it's all too easy to confuse images with reality. But perhaps Magritte's most eye-opening